everybody that you know. Think of every single person. And now, think of everybody you don't know. The entire planet gets covered, the entire human race existing at this very moment. You know, we all have one thing in common. And that is that we all are one day going to die. It doesn't sound like something pleasant that you want to start your talk with, but we need to be aware of this because we aren't. That's the difference between an awareness and a fact. We go on living life like impermanent, that everything will one day cease to exist, is a fact. And we all know this. I'm not sharing anything that you don't know. But the difference is, it's not a sense of awareness. If it was a sense of awareness, you wouldn't spend time having unnecessary arguments with your friends or spouse or spending 15 minutes to half an hour what, deciding what to wear for an event like this. You all are very smart people, but you know that you do exactly the same thing. We waste our time. So allow me not to do any of that and get to the plight of our existence in the 21st century that in 40 years, robots may take over the world and growth might spike unexpectedly. But that's just numbers. Growth is not development. Development is the tree outside your house or the tree you would hope should be there outside your house. Development asks you to look at the environment. Because we don't realize this, that all the elements of nature are within us. Calcium, magnesium, water, vitamins of all the alphabets. They are within us. We are the environment just as much as we need the environment, but our egos have allowed us to believe that we can live without it. We can live only pursuing a life of numbers and growth. But that's not true. So, allow me to share with you a lie that we all have been told. Save the environment. Of course, it's not an entire lie because glaciers are melting and animals are getting extinct. But if it made a difference to our selfish eyes, we'd already have a difference. And I wouldn't be talking about this, of course. What we need to see is save yourself from the environment. We need to save ourselves from what we have done to the environment. We need to save ourselves from what our ancestors have done to the environment. Now it's not time to complain. It's the 11th hour and we need to wake up. Because a dam where it's not supposed to be is going to flood your home. And pollutants that are being released into the atmosphere that should not be are going to populate our lungs. And we go on living like this without a sense of awareness. Because we can't keep fooling Mother Nature. Mothers are always right for a reason. You all know that. And so I thought, do we not care about the environment enough? Because if we would, there would be more people trying to pursue a sense of awareness about these ideas. And of course, that's not true. We do care about it. But no matter how much you care about the environment, it's not more than what you care about something you want your wallet to be full of. And that's money. The importance for money will always supersede the importance of environment for you. And that's why our dreams and goals will always have a set portion reserved for that. And that's fine. We can't live an idealistic life. So what do we do? How do we understand our actions and ideas better? How do we decipher this? I got that answer in the following Buddha story. A tale of two monks and a woman. These three individuals were walking by a river when a woman wanted to cross the river. And the elder monk assisted to help her cross so she couldn't make her way through. She graciously accepted and he lifted her up, left her on the other side and came back. The monks went their own way and the woman went her own way. And it's only after a few days that the younger one asked the elder one that was that permissible for a monk to do? to lift a woman like that and leave her on the other side of a river. And he said something that really woke me up. I left her on the other side of the river, but you didn't. You kept her alive in your mind. And that's something we need to realize because everything we do is fueled by an intention. His intention was to leave her on the other side of the river and get back. That doesn't make him any less of a monk. And so, it's the same with us. We all have one intention driving us. And the key intention of the people that are looking to invest, looking to do something greater, is definitely profit. To a large extent, we cannot ignore that. And if that is what it is, 
let's keep that in our mind and go forward. Because that's the intention is profit, and that's what we have to keep to understand how the environment can work better with it. And so I thought, what idea can keep intention as a profit and yet do something good? And the following story taught me that, and also that you can learn something from every single person. This very joyful man, his name is Ranga. He was my tour guide in Bhutan, and he toured us around the lovely country. And I got an opportunity to show off to him that I was going to be, going to be there to meet the Prime Minister. So I told him I'm going to meet the Prime Minister, so if you have any problem that you want me to share with him, feel free. And he said, nothing. I'm very happy. And this just made me go crazy. I mean, allow me to make a generalization here because we Indians would love to make a complaint because we have so many problems. You know that. And so, is it that he had no problems? I mean, he's not a billionaire. And so, I realized that the happiest country on the planet can teach a country of more than a billion many things. But one of the things that we can easily pick up is that they are the only country, or one of the only countries, to have a waste prevention and management law. The waste prevention and ma uh, management law is all-inclusive, not only for e-waste or paper, it's for everything. Because if you produce everything, why don't you help in prevention and managing all of it? And this is what made me realize how Buddhist principles and economics come together. Economics is focused on production, but Buddhism reminds you that everything is impermanent. If you have a date of birth, you will have a date of death. But that's not the same way we treat our products. We're very happy to produce them, but then we leave them to rot in a pile of garbage. They need to die as well. Because if they don't, they'll come back to bite us first. And this is what made me realize that climate change is not the greatest enemy of nature. Global warming is not, and neither are greenhouse gases. It is greed that is the key enemy of nature. And that will remain, because that's the intention, that's profit. So, how do we make a difference? How do we understand what's wrong with us? Because we are choking our planet every minute with everything we produce. So is it our fault that we keep demanding things, or is it the producer's fault who keeps producing things? There are many theories, but one answer from an economic law called Say's Law will tell you that supply creates its own demand. As supply increases, the economy will make space for the consumer to buy that product. Your income will make space to buy that product. AKA, you didn't need conditioner, your parents didn't need conditioner, and neither did your grandparents, not at all. But now you all use it, and it's a very important part of our hair care routine. But we need to understand how important our hair care routine is when the planet is getting destroyed, as I speak. That doesn't mean you don't need to use conditioner, that just means we need to be more aware of how the things that are supplied are being chosen for us. We are not choosing them. And then they go and pile our planet. And as a human being, we need to be considerate of this. So do we just blame the producers? There has to be a way to uplift them. They too would like to make the planet better. As long as you are a human being, as long as you are a living being on the planet, you should be concerned about that, of course. And so, I got that answer in the discourse of the Buddha. When a disciple went up to him and asked him, who is the most noble or refined human being? And he said, somebody who serves, does something for nobody, is at the most bottom of the pyramid. Of course, this is a rephrasing. Somebody who cares only about others, absolutely negating themselves, is a step higher. Because this teaches you how your compassion is incomplete if it does not include yourself. And then, somebody who serves only themselves without harming others is a step higher. So somebody who serves themselves and others is emotionally. Now if we assume that our producers are the third level, that they only serve themselves, of course they are past that they do destroy the environment, but for assumption's sake, because their intention is for themselves, their profit is for themselves. How do we uplift them to care about themselves and others? Their production, 
and the death of that production? That's the question in front of us. Why would anybody self-manage garbage if we want our producers to self-manage garbage? I myself and in my home have been doing it in the past five years, but that does not make me any more noble than you. It's just that we're human and we need an incentive. We need a reason to do something. So why would anybody do this apart from love for the environment? We need to give them a motive, an intention. And that's what I formulated when I formulated the Impermanence Index, which is II. Because if you don't have an abbreviation, nobody takes it seriously. And so the Impermanence Index is an index that suggests to producers that you too can be uplifted. If you take back your products from the consumers, recycle, reuse, or decompose them far more than you can, your impermanence index is high because you're accounting for that, the impermanence of it. But if your impermanence index is low, that means you are using, recycling, and decomposing far less than you can by taking it back from your consumers. And this is all about what you can do. Because if I'm producing a magazine, 100% of that is reusable, recyclable, decomposable. It's paper. But if somebody else is producing TVs, not all of that may be recyclable today or reusable, decomposable from methods we know. So if 40% of that is possible, do all of that 40%. So that makes a huge difference. Do all of that what we can. And this is, of course, only for tangible and non-disposable products because we can't expect companies running behind tissue papers and earbuds for how much that we can do today. This is an idea that can help us save ourselves from what the environment might have to do to us if we don't account for it. So that's our home. And what's the incentive? The incentive is a tax rebate. The higher your impermanence index, the higher your tax rebate. Now, a question here is, why would the government pay producers to take care of the products that they themselves produce. That does not have to do with the government, with the company, with the country. It's with the entire planet because the United Nations recent report says that by 2030, the world will pay $1 trillion just because of global warming. We don't realize what the trees do for us is free. What the birds, earthworms, bees do for us is absolutely free. And we could never replace them with a machine that is affordable. We will find all kinds of ridiculous ways, but let's avoid doing that. And so, an incentive is not for them. It's an incentive for us to save ourselves. Because if our main intention is profit, and we have to keep that with the awareness of the environment, they need to come together. Because we understand that this is our reality. We can't ignore it. We can't say live without profit. Not today at least. Whereas this is too ideal. It may not never happen in my lifetime. And this is how it needs to work together. Because the Buddhist principles will tell you that everything is interdependent. Nothing lives in isolation. A, therefore B, therefore C, and therefore a hundred other things that have been produced. Everything is interrelated to each other. And that's why we can't look at the environment and money as two opposites. They are two pillars of our life that have to work together. Money is something we pursue and the environment is something we live because of. And so economics enthusiasts will always tell you that economics is only about limited resources and the choices we make with those limited resources. But it's not that fancy and amazing. It's very simple. No matter how old or young you are listening to me today, you know that the most limited resource there is, is our planet. Because there is only one. There is only one Earth, and there is no planet B. We have to take care of what's given to us. Because production could go on, but there is no two-minute boil water solution to erect a mountain range or a forest. We have to preserve what is with us. So allow me to conclude by saying, that the Aditya Pariya Sutra of the Buddhist principles will That desires will never end, but life one day will. So let's keep that in mind. Thank you.